Hey everybody, welcome to the first episode of For Food's Sake, the podcast bringing you down-to-earth dialogues about the food on your plate and its many impacts on people and planet. I'm Matteo DeVos, and today I'll be speaking with Mark Pershing, the CEO and founder of Less Meat, Less Heat, a nonprofit whose mission is to reduce the consumption of meat most damaging to the environment by promoting a climatarian diet. So before we start, I think it might be useful if I give a little bit more context to, to set the scene, so to speak, uh, by explaining a little bit more about what exactly it is about meat in general and about red meat in particular that makes its mass consumption so damaging to the environment. I think a good place to start would be the now rather famous study published by the UN in 2006 by the Food and Agricultural Organization called Livestock's Long Shadow. And the one statistic that keeps being repeatedly cited, that keeps popping up, is that the livestock industry is responsible for 18% of all greenhouse gas emissions. And I think what's shocking above all about this statistic is that it shows that the livestock industry is responsible for more greenhouse gas emissions than the entire transport sector combined. And so what you have here is a study that for many people blows the lid off of conventional understandings of how you can tackle climate change. Because what it shows is that the scale and the process of industrial livestock production is not only incredibly inefficient, but from an environmental perspective, it's completely unsustainable. Now you might be asking yourself, where exactly do these emissions come from? If you look at the land use, for example, of livestock production, you see that it's a huge driver of deforestation and consequent carbon dioxide emissions. A quarter of the Earth's terrestrial surface is used for livestock raising, and a third of all arable land is used for cultivating crops to feed livestock. So here we're talking specifically about uh, soybean and corn production. And if you look, for instance, at South America, uh, you're seeing mass deforestation taking place to make way for this ever-increasing demand for pasture and for cropland to feed livestock. Now, if you look at water consumption, the picture isn't much prettier. Livestock has an enormous water footprint. Conservative estimates talk about one kilogram of beef having a footprint of 15,000 liters of water. Now, to put that into perspective, a kilogram of potatoes has an average of roughly 300 liters per kilogram. And this brings me really to my final point, which is that red meat really is the biggest culprit here. It produces the most greenhouse gases by far. It's around 150% more greenhouse gas intensive than chicken, for instance. And part of the reason of why this is, is that cows and sheep, for example, are ruminants, and they produce methane as part of their digestive process. And methane, as you might know in the long run, can be up to 100 times more powerful than carbon dioxide. And livestock are unfortunately responsible for 40% of all global methane emissions. So that's the part about the farts and the burps that you've probably heard about before. But what you might not have heard about before is that livestock, specifically red meat, are also responsible for 65% of all nitrous dioxide emissions. And that's another greenhouse gas emission, which can be up to 300 times more potent than carbon dioxide. And these nitrous oxide gases that are produced, in case you're interested, are released both in the subsequent metabolic waste that these animals produce, but also through the nitrogen-based fertilizer used in the initial production of their feed. Okay, well, I think that gives you a little bit of an overview of some of the broader environmental issues surrounding the consumption of meat. If this is something that interests you, I'd really encourage you to head on over to www.forfoodsake.me, that's the For Food Sake website, after the podcast, and check out my article, The Climate of You, which talks about your own personal responsibility and relationship with climate change through the lens of dietary choices. All right, without further ado, let's head on over to our first guest, Mark Pershing from Less Meat, Less Heat. Mark, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, so before we get into some of the, the issues that your organization works with, um, could you maybe tell us first a little bit more about yourself and your story and how your organization came about? 
Uh, sure. So <clears throat> myself, I actually come from uh, uh, the other side of things. So I actually come from the environmental um, sector, so so to speak. I um, started off my career in, in marketing and advertising from the, the dark side, actually. <laughs> um, so I, yeah, I, I wasn't really aware of the issues until um, I had a pretty profound uh, life experience that almost uh, ended my life probably about eight years ago that really set me on a different path and made me reprioritize everything in my life um, and made me realize that the things that I was actually pursuing before weren't really all that important, like wealth and money and yeah, right. all that kind of thing. Um, so I realized that uh, living in a first world country, we are the 1% uh, and we have uh, an sure. obligation to give back in some way. Um, because most of the world's population are not that fortunate to actually even have time to consider um, improving the environment, improving other people's circumstances. They're just of course. trying to get the food. Um, so I, that's sort of what put me on this path. And I looked into many issues. I looked into poverty. I looked into um, hunger. I looked into um, saving the pandas, saving carbon dioxide right. emissions from the burning of coal, oil, and gas. Mm -hmm. um, and I always thought, Surely this is problematic, but I didn't really have the science to back it up. So it wasn't really until I pursued um, a master's in environment at University of Melbourne, and I, I got I was exposed to some climate. I picked some climate science subjects because I really wanted to know more about it. I really wanted to understand it thoroughly. Um, obviously, not become a climate scientist, but the best you can do, sort of, by doing a few subjects here and there. Right. Um, so I actually put forward these. Um, scenarios where what would happen if we were to succeed, if we were to actually transition to renewable energy, but nothing else. And what the climate model showed me was actually quite sobering. What I realized okay. from those climate models was that even if we were to be ambitious in our transition to renewable energy, we'd still be facing catastrophic climate change largely because of the, the emissions from the agricultural sector and also largely because of the um, transition of the world's diet away from more traditional diets that are low in meat um, mm -hmm. to this uh, hyper, con like, yeah, hyper consumption of meat that we consider normal in the West, that it's only really been normal in the past couple of decades. Right. So, um, yeah, that's what really woke me up. And then when I um, went back to... Um, the movement and spoke to people about it um, in various organizations. People weren't really interested in hearing me out, and people weren't. And if if they were, they weren't really interested in um, in considering starting this move. Uh, con considering starting this campaign under the the auspices or the brand that I was volunteering under, so 350.org, for example. Yeah. Um. So yeah, that's what sort of got me. Um, thinking that no one's doing this, and once you know something, you can't unknow it. You can't go back to that uh, ignorance ign uh, before. Ignorance is bliss. <laughs> exactly, and especially when it undermines the very thing you're trying to achieve. So, definitely, if the thing I'm trying to achieve is a stable climate, um, and you know this, then you can't just go back to a fossil fuel focused divestment campaign, for example, without looking at this as well. And so is, is that then how you came up with the idea of a, a climatarian diet? Could you elaborate a little bit on, on what exactly a climatarian diet means and, and how um, your organization, Less Meat, Less Heat, works towards that goal? Sure. Well, like starting, coming up with a concept of an, of an off-profit when you've never started any kind of organization is hard enough. But um, <laughs> trying to figure out what, what do we actually do? <laughs> um, like I, I know I know the end game. The yeah. end game is for us to. Well, actually, the end game took a bit of research. Um, I dug around and I did a lot. Of, I spent months and months researching into this, seeing what kind of academic literature is out there, what kind of think tanks are looking at this, and I stumbled upon um, Chatham House, and they're a UK-based think tank, and they've. Yeah. Um, They've worked on a few climate models with the massive open source project of the Global Calculator, which is one of the most comprehensive okay. um, climate calculators. It's the one I used in my TED Talk, which came out yeah. about a week ago. Um, I think I saw it so on your website. Climate, yeah. 
Yeah, you saw that. With that climate model, basically, it shows that very scenario that I was painting before. If we're ambitious in our transition to renewable energy, we'd be looking at up to six degrees of warming with um, a typical Western diet becoming the norm. Whereas if we were to move towards a more carbon conscious diet, not, not a vegan or vegetarian diet, okay. but pack back our consumption of beef and lamb in particular, mm -hmm. and also some aspects of dairy as well, then we would um, actually be able to stabilize the, the temperature at, at or below two degrees, which is what the um, climate scientists agreed would be the upper safe limit for a functioning civilization. Um, yeah, so when, when I dug into what exactly that is, I realized, okay, this is something, um, I basically use that as a template. So I think that the health recommendations of the Harvard School of Public Health that they based that model on recommended um, one standard serving of red meat per person per week. So that's, that's what I based, uh, that's what I used as a baseline um, for the climatarian diet. But then I, I yeah, because it's one thing to come up with a new term, like the reducitarian or sustainitarian <laughs> or there's a bunch of them out, flexitarian. Yeah, flexitarian. Yeah. My, yeah, my problem with all those terms is what is it? What does that mean to be a reducitarian? What is it like? How much meat do they actually eat a yeah. week? Like there's, there's no straight answer. Is it one serving? Is it two servings? Is it five? Sure. It, it, it's not tangible and that was my problem with that yeah and that's what i, I didn't i didn't want the climatarian diet to, i didn't want that to be a problem with the climatarian diet so i used that as a baseline so one standard serving of red meat it's quantifiable it's easy yeah. to follow um and then beyond that I, I like to think of it as kind of a continuum so if you're already there then you can take it even further you yeah. could have cut out red meat altogether you could look at your the next sort of high carbon thing in your diet dairy perhaps yeah. if you eat a lot of cheese then that could be something to consider so i wanted i wanted it to be something that people could continue sort of to work towards and get their friends on board but i have at least a tangible baseline that you yeah. could quantify so is, is there almost like I mean, different stages of the climatarian diet. I mean, you can can you have like different levels of being a climatarian diet? How how does it? Well, I, I, it's, it's a good it's a good question. I thought about that when I first came up with the concept, and I, I thought about it kind of like um, in in uh, in martial arts, you've got like black belt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, that that would be really cool, but yeah, I haven't really um, um, I haven't really. Yeah come up with like levels of climatarian diet i think maybe further down the track i'll probably think about doing something like that but yeah at this point we haven't um we haven't finalized that yet sure now that'd be pretty great to have a a title black belt climatarian diet i'd i'd, <laughs> I'd like that <laughs> um yeah so i mean what are some of the the challenges that then that you see when you when you approach people? I mean, you mentioned this a little earlier that a lot of people, at least a lot of traditional climate organizations, they're not exactly on board when it comes to um, changing diet or, or, or addressing the meat taboo issue. So, I mean, what what what's the kind of typical response you get when you approach either an organization or maybe even an individual about about the climatarian diet? So we, we so far we've gotten some. Um... The responses that we've received so far have really fallen into a few groups. So we've we've um, we've gotten some responses from um, some vegan organisations and some vegans as well. Probably the more hardcore militant ones, um, basically calling us out as the enemy and and right. saying that we're we're actually causing more damage to the movement um, because they they see they perceive this like rebound. Uh, to happen when people move away from red meat, they'll end up meat eating more white meat, hence more animals will die, right. which is an assumption at best. Um, maybe for some people that may be true. For others, that they may end up eating more vegetarian meals. Um, for others still, they may end up eating more wild game, which is... Uh, like kind of like kangaroo which is quite low carbon so yeah. who knows like i think the jury's still out on that i think it's um it's it's problematic to 
um, castigate us for trying a different theory of change. Of course. Than the usual uh, vegan one, which is actually being scientifically. <laughs> if you look into the the, the research around um, how many people go vegetarian and vegan, and then actually go back to eating meat, there's in the huh. states there's five times as many ex vegetarians and vegans than there are actual vegetarians and vegans. And right. the, the the research I've seen, like the, there was a big long like five year study. Um, of, of 11,000 students that went vegetarian vegan over a five-year period of time, and 87% of them went back to eating um, meat. Um, I don't That's know if it's less or more, same, but uh, from what I've seen, like just anecdotally around some, around my friends, they've actually gone back to eating about the same amount of meat, yeah. which is not so good. Uh, yeah, I so, guess <laughs> going cold turkey isn't as easy as it seems, I guess. Well, it also doesn't work, and it also, uh, for, for a lot of people, like, they have health concerns that come up that they weren't aware of when they were eating right. a, a standard diet. Um, mm-hmm. Another as, another as for common response I've received is that it may, um, yeah, like this, a, a lot of climate groups have close relationships with farmers mm-hmm. um, in the fight against the fracking industry, which mm-hmm. is fair enough. You've got a common goal, and you've got a, therefore you've got a common enemy. Um, and they feel like they may stigmatize, um, or, so they may, um, yeah, they may jeopardize those relationships by also putting out the information that agriculture plays a big part in climate change. But I don't think that that's the case. I think that if they do it tactfully, then it can be, it, it can actually improve that relationship because they, they can then, um, highlight the farms that are actually, that are actually practicing good good practices like holistic management mm-hmm. that build soil carbon and that actually um improve the environment right and then yeah i think i think there's there's ways they can do it which won't necessarily jeopardize those relations right, right. so is, is that kind of linked to the 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 movement to towards more locally sourced food or, or grass-fed beef or, or those kind of alternatives i mean is are, are you saying that there's a there's a middle ground to be found here when it comes to beef consumption and that maybe or not beef but at least meat consumption and that maybe one of those middle grounds is locally sourced food um not quite um i think there's there's no there's no middle ground when it comes to you're right by saying beef there's no middle ground when it comes to beef because that by far has the biggest carbon footprint beef and lamb um so yeah i think anything more than once a week as, as as standard serving is yeah we'll we'll keep keep taking us down the path towards climate catastrophe i think we really need to yeah we really need to move away from red meat um because of the land footprint because of the carbon footprint um but and in terms of uh locally sourced i think locally sourced is great from a uh building your community perspective i think it's great to get to know where your food comes from Mm -hmm. Uh, i think it's great to understand the supply chain of of how your food is made um i think these are all positive things but purely from a carbon perspective, it actually, the surprising thing, the surprising reality is it doesn't actually matter. So I could buy a steak source from King Island, which is um, only one hour flight from here. Mm-hmm. Um, or I could, or even I could get beef sourced from like a farm, like an hour drive from here, or I could get beef sourced from Argentina. And the carbon footprint would actually be very similar. The full life cycle carbon footprint would be similar. So the the actual transport and refrigeration of beef accounts for only a couple of percentage points of the total life cycle emissions of of a kilo of beef. Yeah, I've I've, I've heard similar stories even with with vegetables. I mean, there was an article I read about tomatoes uh, being grown in the winter in Sweden um, in greenhouses being much less efficient than. Um, once being grown out in the open in Spain and being shipped over. So I guess I guess yeah. the point is that the, the argument's a little more nuanced than just buying local or buying global. Exactly. There. Sure. Exactly. And it's it's um yeah, exactly. We need we really need to like and that like beyond me, like if you're talking about vegetables, mm-hmm. then yeah, we really need to think about seasonality. Yeah. Um because we've passed peak oil. If you yeah. if you look at uh when we, they, they say that we passed peak crude oil, according to the IEA, back in 2005 or six. 
so that was a long time ago <laughs> already in relative <laughs> um so it's the age of easy to extract um cheap oil is over yeah and so yeah. do you think maybe going back you know about to, to plant-based uh solutions do you think maybe at least for people so for meat lovers out there maybe there's a solution to be found in kind of plant-based substitutes that mimic the taste and texture of meat or you've got you know these startups popping up here and there now that are growing uh meat in labs so this you know the idea of cellul- cellular agriculture do you think maybe that's the way forward um i think i think the way there's many ways forward that could be part of the way forward i think we also really need to realize that meat hasn't always been the central feature of our meals it's only in the past couple of decades that that's been the case right. if you look at all traditional diets whether it be chinese or i come from russia like most people think russian diet is quite heavy in meat and that's not necessarily the case there's a lot of russian food that doesn't have any meat at all and when it does it's not necessarily like a big slab of meat in the middle of the plate surrounded by a little bit of vegetables it's actually a much more balanced meal where the meat is one of the many ingredients of the meal um so we need we need to really relearn how to cook and how to eat where meat, uh, meat, meat is like a side dish or one of the ingredients right. Other than just being lazy and slapping a steak in the <laughs> middle of the plate, here you go. It's yeah. um, and th- if you look at like Chinese food, traditional Chinese food, they they use meat like a flavoring. Like right. they use very small amounts of meat. They use the whole animal as well, um, from tongue to tail. Mm-hmm. So which we also need to do. Um, we need to we need to rediscover that um, organ meats are actually the most nutritious part of the a- most nutritious part of the animal. Um. So we need we need to re-examine our relationship with meat. Um, yes, those substitutes are great, but I think before we even go down that path, we need to do those things first. Okay. Um, but in terms of those substitutes, yes, they are good. Um, uh, I think they're they're definitely part of the solution. So there's, there's a few ones. There's there's a lab grown meat like um, what's it called? Oh, there's one in the, there's an outfit in the states. I've forgotten their, their name. But they're 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 working on um, lab meat, um, Memphis meats. That's what they're yes, called, Memphis yeah, meat. I've heard of them. Yeah. Um, originally started from the research back at Utrecht University, uh, Maastricht University in the Netherlands, um, yeah. and then there's also Beyond Meat, which are recreating meat from um, plant cellulose. Yeah. And um, I, I I Kip Anderson, make of Cowspiracy. I was lucky enough to meet him in Paris, and he was telling me he tried one of their burgers and. Um, it was really weird. It was like almost like it had the gristle of meat and he hadn't <laughs> eaten for like almost a decade at that stage. And wow. he was telling me how weird it was. Best uh, really ever. That <laughs> Yeah. So it's, um, yeah, no, I think there's, there's a lot of potential there, um, for replacing beef, but also we really need to re-examine how we consume meat to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've heard of a similar one. Um, um, called the Impossible Burger that came out recently. It's been all yeah. over Facebook, and 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 I mean the, the talk of the town is that it even bleeds like a real burger. That it's got a yeah. That's, that's the one I'm talking about. That's yeah. the one that keep trying. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, um, yeah. technology. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, in terms of plant based foods, though, I mean, is there something to be said about um, there being potential pitfalls? I mean, I, I hear a lot of people talking about. Um, becoming vegetarian or being more um, starting to eat more vegetables, but then kind of being taken aback when they hear about um, the high water consumption in almonds, for example, that it takes almost five liters for one almond, some people claim, or or, or that, that there's certain processed foods. Um, if you saw the, the recent documentary Before the Flood from uh, Leonardo DiCaprio talks about, you know, the use of palm oil. And, and so I think I think maybe what a lot of people are struggling with is they they turn away from meat and then on the other side you have this you know you have this massive information this information overload telling you that well it's it's not necessarily better on the on the vegetarian side yeah that's why people shouldn't freak out when they see one claim in one documentary <laughs> they should actually examine the claim look yeah. up the peer reviewed science behind it and put it into perspective like if you look into the the relative deforestation associated with palm oil it only accounts for about 10% of tropical rainforest destruction around the world. Beef production accounts for 69% of tropical rainforest destruction. So put into perspective, 
palm oil is bad, but if you've already cut out beef or significantly yeah. reduced beef, then you can do far more benefit um, by actually getting your friends to do the same yeah. than worrying yeah. about which um, product has palm oil in it, which one doesn't. Yes, you probably should do that, but in a lot of countries, it's not marked. It's really hard to yeah. do. So you can get into a complex uh, looking, thinking, oh, does this have palm oil? Does this not? Um, if it's not in Australia, it's not actually mandatory to be marked. So it's actually really hard to figure out, but you can do a lot more benefit yeah. by getting your friends to consider the impact of their beef and lamb consumption than you could ever do by cutting palm oil out of your diet. So I guess this also comes back to the idea of, of maybe the stages of a climatarian challenge that you prioritize, you cut out, you know, beef and lamb first. And then, you know, once you've tackled those two monsters, you can look at, you know, other effects on the climate, but yeah, I definitely get your point. I definitely, I definitely agree there. And it's uh, prior- I think there's, priorities. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and that's the other thing. Like we need to, especially if we're working in the environmental movement, we need to be better at at analyzing, at reviewing and analyzing science, um, looking at claims, and and look and analyzing them and looking at where they're coming from. Looking at the research, is it, is it published? Is it peer reviewed? If it is, what are the limitations of that research? Is it the first? Is it the only study in that field? Is there a, are there a lot of studies to back it up? Mm-hmm. Has it been replicated? Like actually, we do, you don't have to be a scientist to think like a scientist. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Um, moving on a little about the, um, I saw on your website that you, you'll soon be launching a climatarian challenge through an app. I thought maybe that yeah. would be a nice transition point because I think one of the, the problems a lot of people have is this idea that they're willing to do something about it, but they're not willing to put in the research behind it. Um, like you said, you know, you would, people need to do more research, but I think a lot of people would just rather have kind of a solution brought to them rather than they go l- look out for a solution. Um, yeah, which is frustrating with the reality. I know what you mean. <laughs> yes. So having said that, this this app, what is it that, that this app is supposed to achieve or how does it work? So the Climate and Challenge basically goes back to that climate model um, from the global calculator, where if, if people were to um, eat that certain way, as well as coupled with a, a, um, an ambitious transition to renewable energy and so on and so forth, then we'll be able to um, ma- uh, limit temperature rise to below two degrees. So we, we worked that out, reverse engineered that, and tried to convert it into what is that in terms of carbon footprint for people's diet per person per week and uh, so per month. We worked out to be about 40 kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent, um, with the fi- that being the final goal. So we developed the app based on that. We converted that to a point system. So Mm -hmm. one kilogram of carbon dioxide equivalent is 100 carbon points because a lot of people don't understand the scientific notation. So we thought we'd gamify it. We'd turn it into points and which is still based on solid science. And then that will make it easier for people to understand and follow the challenge. Um, We tried it with 4,000 carbon points for the monthly budget and that sort of amongst my meeting friends that worked out to be close to impossible. So we, we tried it at 8,000 being kind of like a transitionary target, sure. um, which will still get people thinking about the relative carbon impact of different foods. It will still educate people. Um, so we use that as the monthly target, like obviously further down the track, once we get a lot of people mastering the climate challenge, making that shift, we'll then, change the goal to 4,000 on so on. We'll, we'll figure it out sort of further down the track. But um, that's, that's how we came up with the actual, the point system and, and the goal of the Climatarian Challenge. And um, okay, so beyond that, so sure. the, the, way, the way the challenge works, you basically, you have that budget of 8,000 carbon points for the month. And then you put in, um, you put in what, kind of meat was in your meal and the approximate portion size of the meat in that meal. And I'm sure people aren't exactly putting their meat on scales before they put it in, into their um, food. So we, we, we kept it approximate. So it's not, it's not going to be a hundred percent accurate, but at least um, people will it see the big difference. Sure. To meat. It raises awareness. People see the pattern. People see the, the impact of eating a steak 
which will use up a quarter of your monthly budget. Oh, wow. For example. Yeah. All right. So, so say that you want a, a fat burger that's going to cost you a, a quarter of your, of your monthly eating. Mm hmm. Wow. Okay. Um, yeah. And and so I mean, yeah, slightly less, but yeah, around about that. <laughs> so does that also include? I mean, does that is it predominantly meat focused, or is there a dairy element to that as well? If you were to, if you were to, I don't know, be taking milk with your cereal every morning, is that something that's included as well in the climatarian challenge? Or at, at this early stage, we 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 didn't like we had extremely tight production budget to make this. Um, app sure. to develop this app we raised twelve thousand dollars through crowdfunding and after all the costs um we were left with about 10 and if you ask any app developer to build a, a multi-platform app for ten thousand dollars they'll 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 tell you they'll tell you to come back with double that amount at least so um yeah after laughing in your face but yeah we, we were lucky enough to be able to build that um under that budget but there was a lot of things outside of scope and dairy unfortunately was one of them um, it's also the complexity of measuring dairy because dairy is unfortunately in a lot of food and it's a surprising amount of food. I remember when I tried to be vegan for like three months, I couldn't believe like when I would go to the supermarket and look at the ingredients on many different things, things I wouldn't even like ever in a million years think would have dairy in them right. to have some kind of dairy aspect to them. Like wine, I had no idea wine. Like, how does has dairy in the filtration process? I had no um, idea. Sorts, <laughs> yeah, there's all sorts of really weird things which are really hard to quantify. So maybe, in, perhaps in some future version, we we can have. I think the biggest thing to remember in regards to dairy is cheese. So milk doesn't have that much of an impact because, um, well, it does. Like obviously, collectively for the human race. Um, milk does, but on an individual basis, mm -hmm. if you put a little bit of milk in your coffee, it has a pretty small relative impact. Yeah. Um, I think if, you, if you're eating a lot of cheese, then that can actually have quite a big impact. There was a study that came out recently showing how um, if someone was to eat quite a lean diet with not much red meat, so actually like a climatarian diet, um, versus someone who eats a vegetarian diet with a lot of cheese, the person eating a vegetarian diet with a lot of cheese would actually have a bigger carbon impact from their diet than um, a meat eater who eats not much cheese, but not much red meat either. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's, that's something I've been really interested in because I, I became vegetarian a year ago and those are the exact type of questions I've been asking myself. I mean, have I subconsciously or even consciously been increasing my intake of cheese and of eggs and everything else to compensate for not having as much meat and is that kind of defeating the purpose so that i think that's definitely questions that people often ask themselves and don't really know the answer to and it's 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 good to raise awareness i think on those issues yeah yeah we, i think yeah i think the like, like going back to what i was saying before with a lot of people going back to eating meat i think the purity thing is problematic like it's it shouldn't be some like some kind of religion. Like everything has to be like pure. You know, I think it's um. I think yeah, there's definitely animal rights considerations to factor in as well. Like we haven't really talked about that. Um, and what what we re we recommend we recommend people do consider free range. People do consider organic for for the environment as well as animal rights perspectives. Right. Um, yeah. So that's something that people should also consider. I'd li I'd like to to shift focus here a little bit now. Um, so. Sure. You, for the individuals, I guess that there's always going to be people that you can't convince. Um, do you think there's something to be said about the kind of responsibilities that lie beyond the individual consumer? So what I mean is there's a lot of people, and I think certain climate scientists and environmentalists are included in this, that don't believe that personal action alone, as you would advocate, will be sufficient to solve climate change. And I think, I think what they're on to or what, they, or what they're trying to to highlight it is that there's perhaps a, a governmental role. Um, and with that in mind, Mark, I, I know you went to the, you went to the COP21 Paris climate agreements uh, last December. Mm -hmm. So could you maybe tell mm -hmm. us a little bit more about your experience there and your take on, on, on what the role of government should be? Um, yes. In an ideal world, the role of government should be to actually, um, to actually take, uh, action on climate change that will address the issue. Sure. Um, we've had 
yeah, that that would be that would be great if that was the case. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of vested interests that really have corrupted the process along the way, and resulted in us finally having um, some kind of agreement after over 20 years of talks. During these, like it, 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 it like it. I remember when um, I heard Amy Goodman talk at. She did a little presentation. Um, Amy Goodman from Democracy Now. She did a little presentation outside of the conference, um, just at a bar okay. um, uh, called Place to Be, uh, right, right near. Um, yeah. Anyway, I don't know Paris, so I'm not going to try. Um, <laughs> but she was Somewhere in Paris. About how, yeah, she was talking about how um, how like there was at, at the last talks uh, in Copenhagen. There was there was uh, one of the one of the one of the girls from the African youth delegation was talking about how we've been meeting for 20 years yet my people are dying and still nothing's been done yeah. so that that really that that's it like we've been what's the point of having more and more and more meetings and even when we finally have an agreement with the US coming in and saying hang on we're not going to we're not going to continue in these discussions unless you can assure us that it's not legally binding and with the final agreement not being actually legally binding um and with the biggest emitters getting away with very minor incremental cuts in their emissions yeah which are not enough to even secure us to below two degrees like not even factoring in um agriculture if you look at the the purely carbon dioxide focused climate models co2 like first climate models like sea roads um, they um, they show you that the the Paris Agreement will take us to three will, will limit temperature rise to below three and a half degrees, most likely. Best case scenario. That's that's catastrophic. Yeah, that's at least ten meters of sea level rise, displacing over a billion of the world's population. Not to mention the shocks to the food system. Not not to mention. Um, like fruit more frequent more intense floods and droughts which will co cause those food shocks which will cause millions of deaths um and th that's not even talking i mean i'm not going to talk about the effects or like there's many people you can just do, like do your own reading like <laughs> we can talk for hours about the potential effects but that's that's horrendous and that's where the political process has gotten us to and that's in the best case and and that's and we call that a success yeah. So the political process has let us down. Um majorly. So I think that yes, uh I I can I can see where people's skepticism of individual action um can be pro like uh, I can see I can see where that that comes from. Yeah, we've but th that being said, it can also drive about very big change on a on a vast scale. Um much faster than the political process ever can. Like if it becomes the cool thing to do, if it becomes a socially unacceptable thing to do, if you look at like in Australia, for example, it's been interesting to see how smoking has changed over the past 10 years. Right. Where 10 years ago, um, I was 22, even, actually even earlier than that. I remember when um, they passed the laws to, um, to ban it in, in bars and I was about 21 mm -hmm. around that time. Yeah. And before that, like, it it would be socially acceptable to smoke when you're out having drinks with uni friends and say I went on a date. Um, it would be rare for the girls to be like, "Oh, he's a smoker. I'm not going on a second date with him." <laughs> Whereas nowadays that would be the norm. Yeah. If, I, if I'm still, I'm not a smoker anymore. But if I if I was and I went on a date, it most likely I probably wouldn't get a second date unless the girl is also a smoker. Yeah. So it's it's interesting to see how quickly that. Uh, social norms have changed, and so I I like to think that this social norm of um of eating a lot of meat and eating big amounts of red meat um can can actually change pretty drastically as well. Where say in, in five ten years time, someone eating a steak could be stigmatized, right? Like that could be looked down upon. Like really, like that could be seen in the same light as driving a Hummer. Like you don't really care, 
you don't really care about a future. You don't yeah. care about any of us. Yeah. And do you, do you think, so you think that's a, a very much a consumer driven, there's no role in government there. I mean, it, what if we were to introduce, for example, a, a meat tax, do you think that could help curb consumption and help raise awareness of the issues? I mean, what's the most effective way in kind of bringing about, because I mean, with, with cigarettes, for example, one of the major ways I think that we helped turn it around was through taxation was at least, I yeah, think, sure. if not because it was more expensive than at least raising awareness indirectly that smoking cigarettes was bad. So could government not play a role there? Yeah, I think there's two two things there. So I guess I was talking more on the global agreement perspective. I yeah. think I don't really see much sort of happening from a climate solution perspective there. Um, but from a local government perspective, like whether it be state or like, um, or your council or even like your yeah national I think yeah, there's there's definitely a role to play there. Um, I think you're right. Yeah, there, there could be some kind of um, tax. I think um, Denmark were looking at introducing something yeah. like that at one stage. I'm not sure if it. I don't think it actually happened. But yeah, there's there's definitely something to be. Uh, um, there's definitely a role to be played there. I think initially there has to be some kind of um, labeling, which could be voluntary at first, and then could be mandatory. I think some countries like the UK are pushing for that, um, and then. Once, once people understand labeling how on, on meat products, their 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 emissions or yeah, yeah, their emissions on on meat products on all products. Sure. Like it'd be, I think people once when they do their shopping, they could see if that if that was an extra label that that would be re-educational. I think people would say, oh wow, that's interesting. Like I had no yeah. idea that that was such a big carbon impact. Yeah. And. Um, and people would that would really help with raising awareness. And once once people are aware, once people once it's common knowledge, I think then um, a tax would would be the next step. I think that I think it has to sort of come in those stages. Otherwise, there'll be a lot of resistance if people aren't aware. Sure. And 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 hopefully with with the success of our campaign, we'll, we can help raise that awareness and drive that shift. And and not I think not just resistance from individuals, but I mean I think the biggest elephant in the room is probably just big agribusiness and and you know big yes, business definitely. lobbying and and stopping efforts left and right. Um, so I mean definitely there again. Do you think that's that's up to the consumer more to 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 stop the demand, or again do you think that there's a need for for maybe local government but policy shifts that in some shape or form curb the power of, 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 of big agribusiness. I mean, where do we go? Where do we go there? Well, that's the tricky one. Like what you're talking about is how to fix a corrupt system. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We've gone. Yeah. Full like circle. That, that's, 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 um, that's really hard. Like if you saw what happened um, in the United States when they tried to propose um, sustainability measures in their dietary guidelines, they had over 30,000 um, submissions from members of the public, um, like the, the biggest amount of public feedback yet, ever. And a lot of these submissions were actually from scientists yeah, from around the country and also around the world. I've, I've got some um, contacts in, in Europe that helped with a lot of those submissions. Um, and they were all shot down because of the massive influence of the u.s agricultural uh, the u.s agribusiness like you said right um so i think to to circumvent that kind of um backlash against policy measures designed to make um make our diets more sustainable um that's going to be that's going to be tricky i think that will require people getting out to the streets and protesting yeah. Yeah. Um, just as is our civic right and duty as as a citizen of any country, um, and and for now, um, in America, they still have that right. May may change. Who knows? <laughs> um, <laughs> Who knows? Trump is just around the corner. So <laughs> exactly. God, God forbid. Oh my God. Like, yeah. <laughs> if you're really interested into um, hearing about the the gravity of the potential danger of Trump getting into power, I'd recommend the recent conversation. Um, Sam Harris, his uh, podcast "Waking Up" is fantastic. He did a fascinating, um, he had a fascinating conversation about the potential repercussions of that, and that no, no, no shit could become a, yeah, could become people's civil liberties in America could very much be very 
quickly and easily curbed. And uh, yeah. yeah, we're all in danger. So pretty yeah. scary. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I won't I won't digress too much. But um, <laughs> but yeah, I think to to circumvent that power, I think people have to have to protest. Yeah, have to hit the streets. All right, and what what about um? What about the role of technology? So I, I, I'm, I've, I've been seeing a lot of articles as well arguing that, um, I mean, without burying your head in the sand, um, there's a, a definite role for technology to play in boosting crop yields, in making, um, you know, growing crops more efficiently, and, and also in just, in just reducing waste. I mean, I, I've seen some estimates that between 30 to 50% of all the food that is produced is, is wasted. I mean, before it even gets to the consumer. So we're talking supermarkets, we're talking, um, you know, vegetables that, that, that don't meet certain, uh, aesthetic standards of, of, of supermarkets. I mean, I mean, that's, that's incredible. Surely there's a lot of work we can do there before, you know, before this food even gets to the consumer. Definitely. You're right. There is a lot of work that we can do. There's, um, there is this, yeah, it's about 30% of food is wasted. Um, and this is especially problematic when it comes to meat because of the much bigger environmental impacts. Um, right. I think, yeah, I'm not sure exactly how that's going to play out, play out, but I think part of it has to come from um, us being okay with eating the whole animal as well. Yeah, I think a, yeah. a lot of people um, are quite wasteful in terms of the amount of the, the various parts of the animal that they throw out. That they just don't want to eat. I think we we need to um, be okay with with eating all parts of the animal. I think that's very um, interesting. Yeah. I, th- I think another aspect of waste is um, yeah. I don't, I'm not sure exactly how to tackle the waste problem. It's not. <laughs> I'd love to expand the less meat, less eat campaign out to include yeah. waste at some stage, or even if we don't have that capacity, like perhaps look at some. Um, some alliances amongst other organizations that are focused on that. I know there was, um, there was some really interesting talks at COP 21 around food waste. Yeah. That there's, there's some, there's, there's, there are many initiatives around the world that are really tackling the food waste problem. There's also some, like, as you know, there's a lot of, um, waste from the supermarket uh, at the level of the supermarket where yeah. they, they throw yeah. out, um, food that's been, like the whole idea of best before and used by, there's people equate them to be the same thing and they're not. Not at all. Um, so a lot of supermarkets throw out what is um, past its best before, but it's still fine to eat. Yeah. Um, so that's a big problem. And um, people who go dumpster diving, supermarkets are clamping down on that by locking up the bins and that kind of thing. I think there's there are some great organizations coming up. I, I think there's one in Australia called Second Bite where they – they get a lot of that food and they um they redistribute it to put those in need yeah like obviously make sure that it's it's fine and healthy to eat and it's, and and i've i've eaten dumpster type food it's it's fine it, it really yeah. blew my mind so and so i you got that from the dumpster this is great yeah <laughs> how are they it just really blows my mind what supermarkets throw out yeah um so i think that there really needs to be some kind of policy oversight from the government um, to uh, I know France, for example, yeah, they just going to say they've, ba- they've banned um, they've banned that, haven't they? They've banned yep. throwing food. Do you, what exactly is specifics of that? Can you tell me? So, I, I, as far as I'm aware, I think it was last year, 2015, that they they banned. So you're no longer allowed to throw away. Um, it's probably it's probably got to do with the best before date. Um, so right. supermarkets are no, no longer allowed to throw away their waste or their their the food. Um, and I think it gets redistributed. I think there's a lot of organizations. I know at least of one in Montpellier when I was living in the south of France that then re- redistributes yeah. it to the homeless. Um, oh, so cool. just, yeah, which which I thought was a great little initiative. Um, I think that was before the law came into effect. But as far as I'm aware, it's 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 been implemented. And I think that's a great initiative. And I mean, it's just, mm. it's the least we can do. I mean, all that food that yeah. goes to waste, let alone how we produce it, at least when it's produced, we owe it to ourselves mm. to consume it. Um, exactly. And and also, like, um, a, lot, a lot of the food that gets thrown out because it doesn't meet the right sort of colors or shapes of fruit and vegetables, it really blows my mind. I remember reading an article, there's, there's a, some 
shop called Freedom Market in in the UK that opened up that actually specializes in selling like misshaped fruit and vegetables yeah. and that other supermarkets buy out. And um, I think it'd be cool if more initiatives sprang up like that to to capitalize on um yeah on that and and get people to be okay with eating some banana that's slightly off color or off shape or whatever definitely. it is definitely um, which yeah I know I'm perfectly fine with that I don't it doesn't need to be any particular shape is yeah. Of course. As long as it's edible. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. All right, great. I mean, um, I think that's pretty much it. That pretty much wraps it up uh, for me. I know you've got your um, your Climatarian Challenge app is coming out on November 12th. Is that correct? Yes, correct. Okay. Globally, it's going to be available on the um, Apple iOS App Store and the and, uh, Google Play Android App Store as well. Great. I'll be I'll be sure to check that out. Thanks so much. Thanks for your time, Tim. Take care. If you'd like to know more about the Climatarian Diet and the Climatarian Challenge, be sure to check out Mark's organization, Less Meat, Less Heat, at www.lessmeatlessheat.org. You can also find his TED Talk on there that we talked about and plenty more facts and figures about meat consumption. Uh, Also, as I mentioned in the intro, you can head to For Food's Sake, Uh, The website is www.forfoodsake.me for more food articles and for more information on upcoming podcasts. If you want more advice on steps that you can take to cut out meat, check out the five-point action plan that I talk about in my article, Climate and You. Uh, Or if you're as terrified as Mark and I am about the the fate of the environment under a Trump administration, uh, check out my article on Trump's environmental to undo list. Also, if you like this episode, and if you'd like to hear more, it'd be a great help if you could rate it on iTunes, leave a comment, or suggest it to friends and family that might be interested. Uh, For next week's podcast, I'll be talking to Dr. Arianne Kelbacher about the possibility of introducing a carbon-intensive food tax, also known to many of you as the meat tax. Ariane is an economist and a lecturer in agri-food economics at the University of Reading in the UK. That's it for now. That's the end of my first episode. Thanks so much for joining me, and uh, I'll see you next week.